If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular listeners' choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the listeners' choice winner. If you're not sure how the listeners' choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today I'd like to introduce Jonathan, also known as John and McLean. Jonathan is Andrew McLean's brother, who we all know is episode number three. Now, John has had an eventing, show jumping, dressage background, the same as Andrew, but he's gone on and done a lot more racing. He also now coaches and teaches people how to train their horses and how to work with horses. So I'd like to introduce today, Jonna. How are you today, Jonna? Oh, well, thanks, Glenn. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Jonna, we start off usually asking people about a quote. So if you can tell us your favourite quote, that would be great. I've got several quotes. I use several quotes in my teaching, but probably the most powerful one comes from a book that the listeners will be familiar with, or some listeners will be from the Tom Roberts book, which is Profit what will profit you and what will profit you not. And I think that is probably the cornerstone to so much of the work that I do. I have my own quotes as well, but that's probably one of the most well-known quotes, a very important one in trying to illustrate to the trainer, the rider, the handler about how to apply pressure and when to release it and and, and in what form. Okay. And can you go to a bit more detail there? Because, you know, like you hear someone – teaching and saying, oh, yes, you've got to kick your horse every third stride or something like that. Can you just ex- yes. explain a bit more about that? As far as the pressure goes, I think the easiest way to illustrate my quote is if you're leading a horse, a young horse, and a foal is probably the best example of that, a horse that is completely naive. In fact, it's probably going to trial adverse pressure. In other words, it'll try the opposite to what you would like it to do. Then the easiest way to try and get the can I say the light bulb to click onto the foal is at the moment that its leg has taken a desirable step in the direction that you would like, and it may be a sideward step in the beginning, that the pressure is released at the moment the leg has taken that new step. And that's when the pressure goes away. And so then the foal soon understands that the instant it actually takes a step in that direction towards the pressure to release the pressure, And that is then the cornerstone, not just to leading, but it'll be to tying up. But it is also the probably one of the most important facets in understanding what the horse should try to attempt to do is to yield to the pressure rather than to resist it. And it's completely learnt these processes. So that's why we have so many horses that are obviously very good to ride and good to lead, but we also have quite a few in the opposite camp as well. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So giving a reward as soon as the horse is doing one step in the right direction, particularly when they're first learning and not just, yep. Absolutely. Mm. This is probably the area that people are very, very good at applying pressure. We all are in whatever form, whether it would be with our legs or our hands or even just our body. But people are not that aware or I would like them to become more aware. Andrew may have talked about this already, but not very good at removing it at precisely the right time. You have to be so aware of the horse's movements that that helps then facilitate the um, the next step in being able to either get a, another movement or another step from the, the from the foal or the horse or the breaking in horse or whatever you're doing to be able to then set up then a much more likely outcome that the horse will then start to trial the more desired reaction and therefore the degree of resistance that you get once that is learned diminishes rapidly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Can you tell me, I know that, that you know you were growing up on, was it Kangaroo Island where you grew up? Yeah, King Island. King Island, yep. Yes, Can you tell me about, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Island, that's right. Your first memories with horses. Well, My first memories with horses, my mother and father were complete horse addicts. My father was a very keen participant in hunting, and as was my mother, which is where they met, here in Victoria, actually. 
And my father was from Kangaroo Ground and my mother was from Melbourne. But later on, my first memories of horses, I moved to King Island when I was five. Obviously, with my family, my father had taken on a job on King Island. And really, it was a great opportunity for certainly all of us. I've got three brothers, Peter, who's involved in racing and Andrew, everybody knows about, and also my younger brother, Nigel. Nigel and I are only two years apart. So King Island was a very remote place. And the easiest way to get around rather than walk or ride your bike, the easiest way to get around was have a horse. You could go so much further and you could see so much more and you had access to pretty much anywhere you wanted to go on the island. So it was really more of a mode of transport until our mother encouraged us to go to Pony Club and do some more formal riding training. She was also one of the teachers at Pony Club, as my father was. He was a jumping coach. So that's how it started Mm -hmm. for me. Okay. And now the train of thought that you're on now, how did that start? You know, because as a five-year-old riding around on King Island, you wouldn't have had the thought, you know, the training that you've got now, the empathy with the horse. You know, how did that come about? I think it started with my mother and then Andrew's – it started with our mother. She was a a very keen dog trainer and a a really good horse trainer as well. Mm Mm-hmm. So I think the empathy really started there and the love of animals generally. And our house was always full of animals. You know, I can remember some period, Andrew may have covered this, but I can remember one period in our life where we had snakes and uh, blue tongue lizards and we had a seal in the bath and we had five horses all around the house. It was a complete menagerie. And I think the empathy for animals really, really helps at an early age to then apply that to your more professional life later on with horses. So I think that's where it started, just a love of animals really. And to this day, I couldn't function without animals. Every time I go anywhere where there aren't any animals, and I've had to do that a few times, the first thing that I miss is not just the companionship of people, but certainly the companionship of dogs and horses. Yep, yep. Thinking about the characteristics of the people that you teach that – What else do they need? So say if you're going to, I suppose, give them some light bulbs, you know, what sort of characteristics Mm. of the people who are open to learning? What else have they got to be, have? Look, it's a good point because one of the things that was interesting, I got pulled up by a client about a month ago when I made a comment and the comment that I made was we want to try and make our training of of horses as emotional free as possible. And she said, well, that's not right because empathy is an emotion. And she was absolutely right. What I meant was that we don't want to try and let fear creep in or anger or any of those emotions creep into our training because that negates the opportunity to be able to study when you should release the pressure because you're upset or you're scared, which is the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I would say probably one of the things that I'm looking for is that people – then or the clients and and participants of the clinic soon work out that the best way to do it is to be really cool-headed but be really preoccupied with the task at hand no matter what happens. And I think that helps override the fear. So that's probably been the most useful piece of information, especially on the more difficult horses, is, you know, making sure that you apply whatever pressures you require in a a really proportional, precise way, but you are so ready to make sure you can reward the horse by the release of that pressure at exactly the right time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thinking about people who've influenced you, because I know Andrew's influenced you, other people who have influenced you and your mother. You've talked about Andrew, you've talked about your mother. Anyone else that you'd like to think that's helped you along the path that you're on now? Is it mainly those two? Is it other people that, you know, that even just support you? Mm, There's a really, really long list of people, but I think that the core group of people that have made the biggest influences in my life, especially earlier on, My father was a bit of a scallywag and and a bit of a larrikin, and I have a a little bit of that in me as well. And I think that helps, you know, to sometimes make light of a situation that you could look at it in a dire way. But he was a really positive, happy person and loved adventure and loved a little bit of risk. And all of us boys are like that. We, We are not worried about risk so much. We like to learn to try and understand risk. And I think when it comes to horses, there's a lot of risk involved, and that's helped me a lot. So certainly my father 
and Andrew, as we mentioned, but also there's been a lot of people on the way too. I've worked with a lot of good horse trainers, a very good friend of mine who's also from King Island, which has helped me get to where I was going with racing, was Peter Clark. He was instrumental in offering me a, a position up there to help train and break in and produce horses for the Hong Kong Jockey Club for the international sale and breeze up sale in Hong Kong. I did that for quite a few years and that was fantastic. That was a really great adventure. My Obviously, my eldest brother, Peter, he was a, a jockey, a very, a very good jockey in his day and then retired to picnic meetings on King Island and that really started, that kick-started my racing. I started riding track work when I was 15 and I just persisted with that or participated in that all the way through to the point where I ended up riding as a jump jockey in Tasmania, which was to the – my parents were not very happy with that, but they promised me that I could only do it for one year, so I did because I saw it as a very dangerous thing. But – and I worked with a, a really nice guy there in Tasmania called Royston Carr. And again, he was a really, really happy, positive person, as was Peter Clark. And then some probably more well-known people. When I was in England, I worked with Luca Kamani at Bedford House there in the UK. And from a racing point of view, that was just an absolutely massive insight into how people on the other side of the world, train their racehorses and manage large groups of people and large groups of horses all at once. And that really changed my mindset into racing. I I wasn't that sure I wanted to have anything to do with racing as a profession. But when I went to England and I worked there, I came back completely inspired and just thinking about what we did there. For them, it was all routine. But for me as an Australian, going from, can I say, conventional racing Uh, training techniques to and to work there was really inspirational and he was he still is an amazing man produces amazing horses Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you said the large numbers you know because large numbers you're treating them more as a number rather than an individual horse what was inspiring about the large numbers or what was you know what was the key things that you learned and got inspired by from over there that's a key question because i came um, the very first thing Luca asked me in the interview when I, he was interviewing me at Newmarket, he, I think it was his manager actually, he and his manager interviewing me and were asking me how many horses I was riding in Australia and I said I was riding up to between 14 and 16 horses a day and I was riding quite a lot of horses of course and it was a real number of production here then but over there we're allocated two horses Okay. and those two horses – You just care for them seven days a week and they are your responsibility. Everything that they do is your responsibility. You ride them, you feed them, you brush them, groom them, care for them in every way possible. And I just think that that is much more likely to produce a really great bond between Mm. horse handler and rider and and horse. It's just marvellous. I really liked that. I thought that was a great concept. Mm, mm. Yes, because I was thinking that, you know, it it would be a numbers thing, but if you're working with two horses and one person is going to notice, they're going to notice all the little things Mm. that are different. Yep, yep. That's right. And we would ride those horses that we were handling. And then if somebody else's horse came up and said, I would like your horse, would you like my horse? You could actually trade it. So there was a a huge amount of interest, obviously the young horses. And so my target was the two-year-olds. I love the two-year-olds. I still love Mm -hmm. two-year-olds, two-year-old race horses or young horses that maybe haven't raced yet because they're naive and you're the first one to feel their potential. And it's a little bit like digging for gold, really. You (laughs) you don't know what nuggets you'll dig up and Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden people say, oh, well, that's a really, really nice you know, would you like to trade it? And and I found it just produced a really proactive way of being involved in the industry. Yeah, yeah. All right, now horses um, that have influenced you or who have influenced you. Like you you said you like two-year-olds. That's a big topic. Yeah, and I I can, you know, I can agree with you with the two-year-olds, yeah, yeah. yeah. What what ones have you noticed as a two-year-old and thought? Look, from a racing point of view, that's a little bit more difficult to put my finger on. 
But in terms of my own horses, I mean, I started off, I didn't own my own horse until I was 22 years old. Up until then, I was just riding everybody else's horses because there were so many horses about King Island, Tasmania. I was being offered horses all the time, so I never needed to own a horse. Mm -hmm. It was only when I went to Glen Ormes and Egg College that they said, oh, you have to bring your own horse. I had to go and buy one. (laughs) And that was the first time I did that. And then my first horse that I rode Obviously, with our friends' horses, the Thorns on King Island had um, two skewballed ponies, and that's how I learned to ride on those two horses. And then a friend up the road gave me another horse, and it was from that horse the Marshals on King Island gave me a horse to ride called Fashion. He was a lovely horse. He's only about 15 15 one. He wasn't very big, but he's well, they'd just done a really good job training this horse. He'd done a lot of cattle work. I took him to the pony club, and then we found out that he was actually really quite fast. So then my brother Andrew nominated me into the King Island Hack Race, which is just basically anybody that wants to turn up. Mm -hmm. You jump on the racetrack and according to height as to where you start, and Andrew the year before I won the Hack Race and then um, the following year I was able to back that up on this horse and I was only, I can't remember, I was pretty young. I think that I was only about 13 or 14 (laughs) or something. And anyway, I won the race by quite a lot in a pair of silks and a helmet that was way too big. And that was probably the beginning of inspiration for racing. But that horse was probably the horse that inspired me to persist with riding. And then maybe later on, I decided to take it on as a full-time career. He was probably one of the most important horses. But in saying that, my brother Andrew also had a Brumby, a standard bred cross Brumby on King Island, who gave me my first eventing starts on the mainland of Tasmania. So he was a really difficult horse to ride, quite a difficult horse to control, but it taught me a huge amount about horses that aren't easy because up until that point I'd only ridden easy horses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really good horses there at the core and then at the other end of the stick, my FEI horses, there's not a single FEI horse of mine that I've either trained or ridden that haven't given me something really valuable as a tool that I now apply to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about, you know, the one that you said that was a bit difficult. Sometimes the difficult ones are the ones that you just keep persisting with and learn. Yes, exactly, exactly. And that's what happened with Saris and Andrew's horse. Andrew gave him to me because he was now the manager of the the trials team and I was fortunate enough to be able to – Ride. Andrew asked me if I'd like to ride his horse, and there was quite a few occasions where he would bolt. You see, he would just clear out and just leave the cross country course or the dressage arena. Or he didn't do a show jumping so much, but certainly in the other two phases he did, and that taught me a whole lot. And Andrew and I've had many, many talks about this, and that is, look, if you game enough and you can keep it together from a mental point of view, riding difficult horses produces really good riders if you can learn to master the horse. And sometimes you have to be a little bit lateral in your thinking or be a little bit courageous or seek advice or get some help. All those things really help produce riders. Whereas I think that if you just ride school horses all day and every day, your boundaries are never really pushed. And that's one of the things, one of my philosophies is that, you know, when people are feeling confident, if you push your boundaries, you discover your limitations in the horses. And we all need to know those in a training environment, not in a competition environment. Mm, mm. Just going back to the horse that, you know, like you said, the horse bolted. Now, when a horse bolts, Mm. they can be in a panic. You Mm. know, they can be scared and they can be thinking for their life, I have to get away from that. But I also understand that the sooner you can stop them, the sooner they can remember that Mm. maybe they don't have to get away as far. What happens when it gets a bit dangerous to Mm. stop them? If if you're trying to stop them but they – they're saying, well, if you rear or I'll stagger, you know, I'll, I'll do something dangerous if you stop mm. me, but I really want to get away. What's the best way yeah. to deal with that? Yeah, that, <laughs> I think that's everybody's nightmare. And, you know, anybody that's had a lot of experience and it sounds like you have as well, Glennis, is that when they're <laughs> running so blind mm. and you pull the reins and you almost think, oh, wow, that's worse. What else can I do? And I'm not saying that people do this, but Andrew and his friend Brett had a horse on King Island. The only way they could stop it, pulling the reins didn't work. They had to lean forward and cover its eyes, and that was how they stopped it. But oh. I'm not saying that we should ever do that. <laughs> That's a dangerous procedure. <laughs> but it just goes to show that 
I think that when horses are running that blind, the worst thing we do, and we, I have to do this with the track riders that I coach at um, Melbourne Polytechnic because I do that during the week, Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays on race horses. And, you know, some of them do get a bit carried away and say, okay, well, that's it. I'm going to go really fast and, you know, start turning out times like 13 and a half seconds of furlong, which is pretty quick. Yeah. And the rider's a bit worried. So one of the best things to do, and it's a little bit easier if you're on a racetrack because you're just going round and round, but the best thing to do is try to coax the horse to go towards a hill and go up a hill that's got reasonably good footing without interfering with it too much. And then when the horse starts to slow down because of the hill, then reapply the reins really positively and, and then make a, a really concerted effort to pulling the horse up. But if the horse is in its acceleration phase or it's being passed by another horse, there's really not much point pulling the range yet. So you really have to wait until the opportunity arrives. And that's not always possible, especially when you're bolting in a public area, mm. and which has happened to myself, you know, bolting down a road. You just have to pick your moment. The worst thing you can do, and I think you just pointed this out before, is pulling the reins with no effect. It's, you've really just got to make sure when you do use the reins that you have an effect without reducing the, the traction of the horse and having an accident. Mm, mm. Mm. Oh, I was thinking it's about the effect of, you know, the horse is scared and trying to get away, but you've got the effect of, okay, I can physically do something, but then is the horse just going to rear or panic or, yeah, yeah, it's a tricky one. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. It is a tricky one, and this is where a lot of people say, you know, just use a single rein stop. And what they actually mean there is basically turn the horse in a circle. And if it takes that, that's what you have to do. Mm, mm. But, you know, plan A should always be try and keep the horse as straight as you can and use both reins. And then if that doesn't work, well, then you may have to do a circle for whatever reason. But generally, if your stop button doesn't work, well, your turn button's not really going to work unless you can turn the horse in such a tight circle that you can actually get it to slow down. Yep. In our case, Saracen, the horse that I was riding with Andrew, the only way Andrew could stop him when he was on the beach galloping, because that's where he did a lot of galloping uh, with this horse, chasing kangaroos and frolicking around King Island, was run him into the deep sand up to the sand dunes. That's how he slowed him down, or oh. into the ocean. Yep. But, you know, those aren't always available. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. But it just goes to show that when a horse is practicing fly responses, it's quite damaging, you know. I was competing this horse when he was well into his later years, mm. and he still had that trait. It didn't matter that he was older, he still had that little switch in his head and he said, oh, well, that's it, I'm going this fast, I'm out of here. I've just got to get away. Like a switch. And yeah. it feels like a switch. Yeah. I've yeah. just got to get away. Yeah, it's yep. Crazy. Yep. crazy, isn't it? Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right. What about horses? Now I'm going to go to jumping problems. Yes. What do you see as the most common jumping problem? You know, whether it's rushing or running out or refute, whatever, that you see riders do, but they don't get, you know, they don't get what the horse is telling them. What's a problem yeah. and then how, how are we going to fix it? Look, the most dangerous one is rushing. There's no doubt about that because when a horse rushes, it actually doesn't jump in a parabola. The, the takeoff point and the land point, the fence is not in the middle of those two points and it's usually flat and usually the front legs, certainly the forearms and the knees are a little bit lower. So the risk of hitting the fence and having a rotation is just so much more increased when the horse is in flight mode. And, you know, I can feel that and I can remember having those feelings when I was steeple chasing and hurdle racing in Tasmania, is that the horse if it was really, really difficult to hold at the start. It's not going to jump well. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I learned really early on was if you have a problem and the horse is going to rush, don't try to correct it before the fence. Don't try to correct it when you're in the in the jump zone, you know, two or three horse lengths away from the fence, but correct it after the jump because otherwise if you interfere with that horse prior to the jump, you're actually going to change his tempo. You're probably going to change his line a little bit, but you're certainly going to change how fast his canter is going towards the jump, and that will change his perception of his takeoff point, which increases the likelihood of an accident. So you're better off to make your corrections on the far side of the fence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, then. So that's the rushing. What about if they're running out, if they consistently run out to the right? What's the problem there? You know, you're yeah. 
a problem that they consistently run out, what can we do to stop the running out? Okay. The running out, whether to be to the left, and some horses do it both ways, but most horses that run out tend to favour a certain side, and it's exactly the same as dressage. We've got to come back to the flat and we've got to get control of the shoulders and the flexion and reduce bend at all possible points. So, in other words, perfect straightness. Perfect straightness so well that even if you soften your rein and you reduce or even eliminate, if you like, total contact and dare the horse to run out in training, and this is how we fix those problems, is that you almost dare the horse to run out, but when it does, you're going slow enough that you can do a transition before you depart the fence. And then if the horse runs out to the right, and this is what you, you see this even at Olympic level, the horse will run out to the right. So in other words, it's completely ignored the correction of the left rein. So then the rider turns it right and then reapproaches the fence on the right rein and the horse will run out right again. Every time it happens, every time I see it over and over again, it's really quite predictable. So if the horse does run out to the right, the best thing you can do if you have time, and it's not always possible, is to halt and then turn left and then come back onto the fence off the left rein, not off the right rein. So you're going across the tracks of the fence. Do you understand what I mean? It's a bit hard to yeah, explain so it's this. Yeah, breaking um, the pattern. Just with yep. sound. Yep. Yeah, but I think if you You're if you breaking picture the pattern it. and you're... Mm. Yeah. So if the horse runs out to the right, then if you can, do a left turn and then reappear on the run outside... So you've basically done a little bit of a light bulb to the left, if you know what I mean. So the horse has run out to the right, you've pulled the left rein and said, no, you've got to come back to here and then cross your tracks on your approach line, come back to that same fence off the left rein and it'll jump it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. What about if a horse, a horse that may have been a jumping horse, you know, may have been jumping, may have been jumping confidently and then all of a sudden they've stop jumping. Now, they may have had the rider, might have had a fall, and might have had a bit of a crash, and then the horse says, oh, well, I'm mm. not going to jump anymore. What's the best way to train that horse to start jumping again? Look, it's the same as running out, really. It all comes back down to making sure that the horse is listening to you and not listening to its environment. At the moment when the horse stops or the horse runs out, the effect of the jump in whatever form it is in, causes the horse to do a certain action. So therefore, the inputs of the rider are either not being heard or not being issued or not being issued clearly enough. In other words, it comes down to training. So depending on how practiced the horse is at these things and stopping is a difficult one because what I train my clients to do in training and what they're allowed to do in competition is not the same story. (laughs) But we can still achieve the same result. So, for example, if a horse stops, one of the things that you can do if you have good buttons in all directions and you have a reverse button and the jump isn't very big and it's not solid, for example, a show jump fence, you can... Every time that the horse stops, then you can just say, right, and remember the first, now the quote that I said before is, profit, profit me not. And that's all about when the pressure disappears. So as soon as the horse stops, if you then just say, right, now reverse a step, now reverse a step, now reverse a step, now reverse a step. So you now hopefully about four lengths away from the jump and then put your leg on and say, now jump over it. And then the horse stops again. So then you say, and reverse a step, and reverse a step, and reverse a step, and reverse a step. Now go over the jump. If you do that, Within about three or four times, the horse will go, well, the pressure hasn't gone yet and I'm still looking at the jump. I think the easiest way to get over this is pop over. And then when you do, you let go of all pressure and then you know, give him a big yep. cattle and tell him what a champion is and then present the same problem. So, again, it all comes down to training. It all comes down to whether the horse is listening to you or the effect of the jump is going into the horse and he's not listening to you at all. I think there was something that you said, you know, if the horse has got good buttons in all directions – so they go forward, backwards, yes. sideways, go right, left. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 So it's the whole, you know, we've talked about it's not going over the jump that's necessarily the problem. It's the exactly work right. in between the jumps that needs to be worked Correct. on. Yep. Yep. That's okay. exactly right, Clannis. And that's why I said we've got to come back to dressage. And, you know, isn't it? It's quite amazing. I, I just think to myself, you know, I started off doing a bit of pony club and a bit of jumping and whatever I wanted to do, including racing. And now here I am 
at whatever age I am talking about how the importance of dress code. It's so true, though, is that everything comes down to that, and that's why I think part of my other business that I'm just starting to get going is really the benefits of dressage education on racehorses. Mm. And no one's really, really explored this yet, and they're just starting to now. But when the horse is actually listening to you, you know, these great horses, the Winxes, the Black Caviars, the Kobe Divas, all those horses, they're pretty simple horses to ride. You look at them, they're, they're pretty malleable, they're pretty manoeuvrable, they're pretty quiet, they don't spend a lot of energy in the mounting yard in resistance. They just go out there and they give it their 100%. It's no wonder they're good. Well, maybe the reason for that is because they're actually listening and they've been trained properly. Mm. Mm. Do you meet much resistance in that, in, in saying that racehorses need dressage? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, the racing fraternity, uh, racing is a difficult game in lots of respects, but in terms of education, there's no ongoing education systems in racing that are formalised, and that is ridiculous. Uh, that has to change. If we wish to change the welfare outcomes and we wish to change the safety figures, the only way to do this is to be able to make people better informed and use evidence-based systems, not hand-me-down-based systems. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that would come in the track work rider and the jockey education as well because it's no point saying, oh, we'll just send all our two-year-olds out to do some dressage training. If the horses then come into racing, the riders that are riding them would also have to have a bit of basic knowledge. Is that right? Or Absolutely right. That's worded really well. I think that that's exactly it, unless the ongoing education flows through to all the staff. I'm talking about making the way that people deal with a difficult horse in the stable is universal. It's not, oh, one person pats him and calms him down and the other person smacks him. I'm making it really universal so the rules for the horses are clear. I mean, it's all about the welfare of the horse and the longevity of its life and its productive life. That's exactly right. Mm, mm. I love the idea. I just wonder about the resistance you'll get from, you know, from new ideas. I suppose oh, any new massive, ideas. But yeah. I'm not going to stop. No, no. Well, new Absolutely. ideas. And yep. look, new ideas, full stop, exactly. Mm, mm, you know, and Andrew, you can see, Glennis, you've known Andrew for a long time and you would have seen the evolution and all the resistances that he and Manu have had to go through in the evolution, not just the ABC system, but now ASI. And there's you know, slowly but surely those effects are, are being absorbed by people and, and because they're seeing the benefits of it. Mm, mm. The way I look at it, John, I, I mean, you know, once upon a time they thought the world was flat. You know, there's new ideas coming through all yeah, the time. Right. And uh, even though they're coming a lot thicker and faster. Mm. In this century, I suppose mm. the world's a, a smaller place, you know. I mean, even things like podcasts, you know, we can we can have a chat and we can have thousands of people mm. listening to it. So, yeah, yeah. If you're an equestrian coach or a riding instructor or even if you aspire to be one, have a look now at the free video series for horse riding instructors. It's on horsechats.com. All right. Um, now, your proudest moment with horses, what's that been? I have written down a list here and it's it's – a fairly long. I've got so many. I think my earliest, proudest moment was finishing my first cross country on King Island, and it was probably I fell off in the water jump because one of the jumps that we had to jump were floating 44 gallon drums inside a dam, and we had to sort of wade out to in through this dam. And the floating 44 gallon drums were held in place by a star picket, so you know, probably not <laughs> a very safe jump. Yeah. But my horse did go over it. But I didn't stay on it and I fell off. But then I was able to get to shore and catch my horse and continue on. And I was so pleased that I finished. It was just amazing. Okay. And I have a photo of that. I've got a photo of me. So that was one proud moment. I think the other one that is also important to mention is finishing my first jumps race. I was worried. I'd heard so many stories. I'd been training and trialing and got my license and I'd been accepted as a jumps rider for that but jumping out of the barrier for the first time and going lickety split to your first jump with a whole field of horses finishing that was a real high so that was I was pretty proud of that that I'd done that 
And then the other one is finishing my first three-star spray farm was quite a long time ago, and it was Australia's first CCI event. We went from advanced to CCI start events, and spray farm was the first one. And there was a huge, huge draw to that. You know, all the famous event riders in Australia were there, and they all had multiple horses. I'm riding a, um, a recycled horse. Although I had two stops, I didn't fall off, and I finished that. And that, to me, that made me realize that I could rub shoulders with whoever I wanted because imagine how good this would go when I'm riding a horse that I'd trained myself. Mm, mm. So that was pretty amazing. The other one that I've written down fairly short notice to see if I'd like to go to India to represent Australia in a um, eventing team, that fell through because of some disease that broke out in Mumbai. So in the end, it was shifted to a show jumping event and we ended up winning a silver medal. And I went over there with Colleen Brook and that was a really proud moment. And although there were only us, uh, the only Australians there, it was an international event. But that was a really proud moment because one of the things that the Indians are really good at doing is they're really, really good at fanfare. They're really good at celebrations. Like even if it's only a small event, they make you feel like, you know, you've just conquered the world. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel proud because of the atmosphere that so that was good and also you know traveling with somebody like Colleen Brook I mean what a great opportunity that was too mm. there's so many of them probably winning on the World Cup weekend in Sydney that was pretty good too that was a pretty stiff competition although it was only a one star event there were some pretty smick horses for that line up on the World Cup weekend for eventing and winning that led from the dressage through the cross country double clear and then show jump clear that was pretty excellent I think that also the other one that was most memorable was that I had a contract to do for the TAFE College at the time. They sent me to Kuwait to help with the police horse training systems over there, and I did that. And then once again, they are really good at fanfare as well. When I finished that, I was there for, I think, three weeks. Mm-hmm. I was there for a long time with the police horses. Yep. And at the end of it, they produced a big ceremony, and the emir came out and presented us with gifts and trophies <laughs> and things like that. And that was that. Very memorable. You know, it's all about the fanfare, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Have you got a book that you'd recommend for our listeners? There are just so many books. I mean, I keep going back to not so much of the books that I would like people to read if they're readers because it's easy if you're a reader. But if you're not a reader, I think they're probably one of the best books that is really very, very user-friendly is the, and, and they're getting quite old now, is obviously the Tom Roberts books because these are Australian systems that we're talking about and we have we have something really, people don't realise how valuable or how good our resources are and how historical they are. But you read those books and you think, oh, yeah, a horse used to, and maybe the words aren't that accurate in the way that they describe how a horse thinks or whatever it does. But at the end of the day, it really produces a thought that helps you realise what produced the outcome. And I think for people that aren't readers, that would be my recommendation. And I think a lot of the books, the I still keep going back to uh, the Equitation Science book, um, the Paul McGreevy, Andrew McLean book. That's always a really good reference, but that's, you know, it's a fairly out there book, mm-hmm. quite detailed for the people that love reading. So, yeah. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Now, I know that you're looking forward to doing some work within the racing fraternity about, you Mm. know, even if it's not called dressage, if it's just called you know, basic yes, basic groundwork or, or, you know, or not basic groundwork, but basic riding. Yes, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But what are your plans for that? How do you? I've got big plans for that. That's going to be my next um, massive foray. I feel as if I'm in the best position to make a difference here and if I can't make a difference, it doesn't matter. I've tried and, and I, I don't think I can get to the point where I'm not able to do these things and then regret that I haven't tried. So for me, the business I'm starting is called Train to Win. In fact, that's the business name is Train to Win. And it doesn't matter what you do, you're trained to win in some shape or form. And it may only be in your head, but everybody's training to do something. And the best outcome is if you succeed. So from a racing point of view, the Train to Win concept is really quite simple. It's making sure that the handlers 
of the weanling, ultimately the yearling, ultimately the breaker, then through to the racing stable, everybody's following a similar pattern. Everybody's following rules that are evidence-based. And and I see this all the time or and hear of it all the time where the, the way the horse is treated in the stable when he's back at the stable compared to when he's at the race course is a different person and they react different ways. Even the voice, even the tone, even the ambience of the whole training situation is completely different to what it is when the horse is in the stable. And look, at the end of the day, we just want a really relaxed, predictable horse. Well, we don't get that through using different techniques on the same horse it's only going to confuse the horse so i want to make things more universal so you know andrew said this to me quite a few times and i've said it to a lot of people as well i don't mind what system you use but just make sure that it's a system and be consistent with it don't swap and change systems so you know and we hear this a lot you would have heard this a lot then as people say oh yeah i just take the good bits out of everything (laughs) And the way that I apply that is that if I went into a car yard, a wrecking yard, and say, I'm going to find every good bit of a car that I can find, I won't end up with a car. I'll end up with some sort of really ridiculous-looking ornament. It won't be a car, though. Mm. And I think that sometimes horse training gets like that. So I think we have to make sure that we have, you know, some rules that we apply that are really, really fair and consistent, but they're duplicatable not just in training, but they're also duplicatable in the performance arena, whether it be racing or whether it be equestrian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, just summing up your philosophy, Jono, if you can sum up your philosophy, just so people – have got, you know, if you've got sort of one, a, a few sentences just for people to take away and think about to sum up what we've talked about today, that would be good. The easiest one to remember is without resistance, there is no opportunity to train. So when you meet resistance, don't be scared of resistance. In fact, I spend all, all my time when I'm training horses looking for what resistances appear because that tells me what the weakest link is or what my homework is or what I can't have or something that the horse isn't able to give me the correct answer to. So if you apply pressure to a lead rope and the horse resists you, that just basically says that the horse doesn't lead. It doesn't tell you that he doesn't want to go somewhere. It just says you need to do more training. So rather than thinking resistance is a negative thing, think it is a training opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, what about people contacting you, Jono? How can we do that? Uh, well, I've never been easy to contact and I've <laughs> slightly been into and I've done this deliberately. I mean, as you can imagine, I'm very busy and I'm not sure why I'm building a website because I'm not sure that I need to be more busy than I am. <laughs> but I do need to be more available and that's the point. So I'm starting a website. I'm hoping yep. to have that done by the end of the year. Okay. The easiest way to contact me is most people contact me via Facebook and Messenger. Okay. And I'm John McLean on Facebook and I think my phone number is there. Yep. But I also have an email. So – I do quite a lot of, um, how can I say, uh, coaching and training on the phone for the people that are really remote in different places of the world. So at the moment, that's the best way. Okay. If they still can't find me, just ring AEBC and ask my phone number. That's probably the other way of doing it too. I was going to say, we can put the details on our um, our website. So it'll be horsechats.com slash Jonathan McLean. Yep. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Look, thanks very much for talking to us today. It's been very good. I think you've given people a lot to think about, a lot to go away and work on, and lots of exercises for them to do too. And I think the key there is uh, good buttons in all directions. It is exactly (laughs) that. Well put. Okay. Thanks, Jono. Thanks, Liz. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 